All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Smaha, and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you for joining tonight's discussion of wildfires, forest management, and climate change. This year's record-setting wildfires on the West Coast have drawn attention, including at last night's vice presidential debate, to a wide range of complex issues. And tonight we plan to bring clarity to the ecology and science of wildfires. I'm very pleased to have with me tonight, Eric Wahlberg, Manomet Senior Program Leader for Climate Services, and Neil Williams, Manomet's Applied Forest Science scientists to help us understand the relationship between fire, forest, and society. If you're new to Manomet, we are a nonprofit focused on empowering stakeholders with science. Since Manomet's beginnings in 1969, our programs have branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts bird based bird banding operation with shorebird recovery and habitat management, forestry and climate science, fisheries and more. Manomet has its foundation in science and works with many global partners to create a thriving future. I'd like to share just a couple of quick things before we begin tonight. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box to enter it. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of tonight's presentation. If you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. Thank you so much for joining us. Now I'd like to turn it over to Eric and Neil. Great. Um, thank you, Danielle. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, as Danielle mentioned, uh, the 2020 fire season in the Western U.S. has been in the headlines with an increasing number of lives and homes lost and widespread air quality problems. At the same time, there's been a swirl of conflicting information on the causes and solutions to this extreme fire season. Our goal in tonight's presentation is to explain some of the linkages between several aspects of this complex situation. In particular, we'll be addressing the following questions. First, what are the climate change related drivers of fire risk? How are forests responding to changing fire regimes? What can be done in the way of forest management to reduce risk? How are urban development patterns influencing risk to human communities? How can risk to human communities be reduced? We'll be discussing all of these questions in, in the context of what's happened in the western part of the U.S. Um, during the first part of this 2020 fire season. So uh, many of the um, specific examples that we use uh, will be tied to the Cascade Mountain region, surrounding area in Oregon and Washington State. Um, but I think for the most part, the information we're going to present tonight um, has much broad, broader import and um, can be considered to be of framing that's applicable to um, broader geographies. Okay, in terms of the structure of our presentation tonight, um, first up, I'm going to cover the climate change related drivers of fire risk. Um, after that section, I'm going to pass it over to Neil, and Neil's going to spend some time um, discussing forest response to changing climate and some of the forest management options that we have at our disposal. Uh, then Neil's going to pass it back over to me. Um, I'm going to cover um, a range of topics on impacts to human communities, uh, try to explain uh, why it is that we're seeing um, those problems um, exacerbated over the last few fire seasons, and then close things out with some thoughts on how to build resiliency for human communities subject to these fires. Okay, starting off for the um, climate section here. Um, you know, I think at this point, sort of everybody's got the memo on climate change, and we all understand that the planet's warming. And I think that we all at this point understand that it's, it's largely due to the burning of fossil fuels and the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I'm certainly not going to dwell a lot on, on that sort of basic science. But what I am going to try to do in this section is to try to draw some linkages between uh, what's happening uh, with temperature and precipitation change and what the ramifications are for our forests. And then um, as I pass it over to Neil, he's going to delve into some of those topics in, in more detail. So, so this map shows um, actual measured temperature change um, over the last 35 years or so. 
and the way the scale reads is the darker red or, or the more dramatic increases. And so for a large portion of the West Coast, um, we've seen an increase during this period of uh, one to uh, 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, um, a, a significant change. Uh, but as I'll explain, um, even uh, you know, what seems to be um, you know, uh, a less than dramatic increase in temperature um, actually has disproportionately large impacts on our forests. And, and to start to give you some example of, of why that is, um, you know, this map shows annual temperature change. Um, but embedded within this are changes to extremes. Um, so that means that as average temperature goes up, um, we get an increasing frequency of extreme heat, um, and that extreme heat is actually higher in temperature. Um, so I think all of you probably remember um, recently there was uh, an extended period of severe drought on the West Coast. And so what happens in terms of forest impacts is a phenomenon called hot drought. Um, where you get the intersection of these increasingly warm temperatures and, and very dry conditions. Um, that led to directly to a fair amount of forest mortality. Um, but the warming temperatures also enable um, change in range of, of several pests and diseases. And in particular, um, you've probably read in the news media about the mountain pine beetle. Uh, the warming temperatures both increase, increase the range of the mountain pine beetle and um, the prevalence of the insect. And so we ended up in a situation uh, where there were some very large stands of, of dead timber um, from the beetle infestation. Um, and then that in turn uh, fed into uh, some of the extreme fire situations that we've had. So we don't know exactly what greenhouse gas emissions rates will be in the future. Um, and that has everything to do with um, policy making and, and decisions we make um, on sort of linkage between energy generation and the economy. Um, but the way the science community deals with this lack of clarity on what the emissions will be is, is different emission scenarios. So uh, these two maps show projected temperatures um, out to the end of the century. Um, on the left, the RCP 4.5 um, is reflective of a, a sharp drawdown in emissions. Um, the RCP 8.5, on the other hand, um, is a continued growth, um, sort of a continuation of a business as usual trajectory in emissions. And, and you can see that results by the end of the century in a very different situation in terms of, of temperature rise. Um, and as I'll explain um, in, in a couple of the following slides, uh, that in turn ends up having um, some fairly dire consequences for a forest. So the take home message on this slide um, is that you know, climate does really have bearing on the situation that we're talking about with the fires. And so one absolutely crucial element of, of trying to get this problem under control is drawing down greenhouse gas emissions rates. So it, it seems a little counterintuitive. It's not a direct intervention in our forest. But without that, um, a lot of the, the forest management op opportunities that Neil's going to talk about um, become much less effective if, if we aren't able to make that change. Okay, moving on to um, precipitation trends. So uh, this again is actually measured information um, and compares the last 35 years against um, an early 20th century average, just as was the case in the temperature map. Uh, the way this reads is in percentage. So the darkest brown is a 15% decrease in annual precipitation during this period. Uh, the darkest green is a 15% increase. And so you can see looking at the west coast of the U.S., um, it's a mixed situation. You know, some areas are getting drier, some areas are getting wetter. And sort of the rule of thumb on a global basis on this phenomenon is that wet areas are getting wetter and dry areas are getting drier. So we can expect those trends to continue into the future as the climate warms. Now this has um, some counterintuitive effects in terms of, of forest impacts. Um, you might think on the face of it that if an area is getting drier, it's going to suffer more fire, and if an area is getting wetter, it's going to have less fire. And depending on the timing, that can be the case. But I'll give you a couple of examples where that actually gets turned on its head. Uh, for example, an area that's getting wetter, depending on the seasonality of it, say for instance, um, they're increasing spring rains, that can actually lead to more vegetation in, in the ground cover. 
And so you've actually got more fuel. And then if you have a dry, hot summer, um, that becomes an actual factor that can exacerbate the fire situation. Um, on the other hand, um, that same phenomenon um, in drying areas can lead to a lessening of, of fire threat. So a very complicated situation. But again, sort of the take home message here is that the temperature change really is uh, the strong driver. And one of the reasons that temperature change is, is such a, an important piece of the puzzle in, in terms of, of the change in, in fire regime that we're seeing is that temperature drives um, a very significant change in vapor pressure deficit. And uh, VPD um, can be thought of simply as the drying power of the air. And, and let me give you an example. If, if you hung laundry out on the line, on a day when it was 50 degrees, it was a bit foggy out, you know, you could hang it out in the morning, go out in the evening, and, and really no change would have occurred. You know, you, your laundry would still be damp. If it was 80 degrees, a sunny day, lower humidity, um, it might take three quarters of the day to dry your laundry. Um, if you were in Death Valley and you went out and it was 105 degrees and the humidity was 5%, you might dry your laundry in a half an hour. And so that same phenomenon um, influences our forests um, in a couple of ways. Um, one is direct impacts on forest health. Um, and, and what we're seeing, it, it, there's a, a nonlinear relationship between vapor pressure deficit and temperature. So uh, a fairly small incremental increase in temperature actually drives a, a much larger increase in VPD. And so we are starting to see forests sort of pushed out of their comfort zone, if you will. And then there's also a drying effect on any um, fuels on the ground, any down woody debris, et cetera. Um, and so this has been a really important piece of the puzzle and, and many of the scientific studies that have identified climate as being a sig significant factor in, in the change in fire regime uh, point to this change in, in vapor pressure deficit as being a key feature. And then finally, to close out uh, my section on climate, um, this figure sort of ties together a number of the different factors that I've talked about here. And this is from a study that, that models um, land area burned um, based on ACC, which is here, um, anthropogenic climate change. Um, so the red line, um, which shows the model, you know, actual conditions with um, climate change and, and the associated increasing temperatures and change in VPD all cranked into the mix. And you can see as we go through the years, shown on the x-axis at the bottom, um, we see a fairly significant increase um, in land area burned. Uh, the black um, shows backing out um, the human-induced climate change piece of this, and then the um, gold line at the bottom um, just shows you the aggregate area burned uh, based on that difference. So hopefully that does a good job of um, laying out some of the basic factors associated with climate. And now I'm going to pass it over to Neil. Take it away, Neil. Thanks, Eric. I think you'd shift to the next slide. Thank you. So as Eric has, has explained, climatic factors are influencing aridity and climate change appears to be increasing the aridity of fuels during the fire season. Um, and fuel moisture levels are often used as a course metric of the likelihood of fire occurring if an ignition is present. And the map you can see on screen uh, shows simulated summer fuel moisture levels across the US, and specifically what we call, or fire scientists call 100 hour fuels, which are fuels that take 100 hours to dry out. Um, so they're pieces of dead wood that are approximately three to 10 centimeters in size. And you'd find a similar trend to what you see here with uh, lower fuel moisture levels um, in the west than in the east. You'd find that same trend if you go up to thousand hour fuels, which are your coarse down woody debris, your large logs. Those fuels are harder to ignite um, because they, they take longer to dry out. But once they do ignite, then they really produce a lot of heat, a lot of energy. And they're what fuel these really severe wildfires that we've seen. So as you can see here, uh, the fact that we have more uh, drier large fuels um, is one explanation for uh, why we see such larger blazes on the west coast than we tend to here on the east coast. Um, so if we could move to the next slide we'll take a closer look at the relationship between climate and, um, and various drivers of wildfires. 
and this may look a fairly complex, um, complex slide, complex diagram, um, but the the link between climate here and um, and fires is is fairly obvious. Um, we have climate, weather, and then heat as we go down this this pyramid. And what we're looking at on the the x-axis is spatial or temporal scale rather, and on the y-axis is spatial scales. And at the smallest spatial scales and the, the scale of seconds, um, wildfires like any other fire require oxygen, heat, and fuel to light or to ignite. Um, but when we look at the news forecasts or the, the news reports um, and read um, magazine articles, we're looking at fire behavior at larger spatial scales than that. And we're, we're normally thinking about um, topography and weather and fuel as being the driving forces there. And weather is particularly important influencing how a fire, um, whether a fire will spread, as well as how it will spread. And we're thinking about factors like wind, temperature, and precipitation as being important. Topography also governs fire spread. Um, for example, a, a fire tends to more, progress more quickly um, going uphill than it does down. Um, and topography influences the uh, fuel moisture content as well. Um, fuels obviously determine whether a fire can spread. A fire can't spread if you have an, a patch of, um, of open ground with no fuels on, which is why as a firefighting technique, you'll often see fuel breaks being constructed by, um, by just cutting down the forest. So the, the, the distribution of fuels, the type of fuels, the amount uh, influences fire spread. And then when you move up to larger spatial scales and larger temporal scales, climate is, is really the ultimate governing regulator on weather. So long-term climate, long-term temperature, and BPD, as Eric has explained, influences whether a fire or influences the probability of extreme fire days or of, of burning occurring. And then vegetation, um, different types of vegetation have different flammabilities, different types of vegetation have different physiological responses to climate. Uh, so that's an important driver of what fuels will, are like and what fuel, or how fuels will behave. And at these long time scales and large spatial scales, climate um, ignitions, the, the probability of having an ignition, whether that's human caused or lightning caused, and lightning is the predominant wild um, factor of factor behind wildfire ignitions um, and vegetation. These feed into what we call a fire regime, which is basically a description of the relationship between vegetation and fire for a specific forest type. And we'll um, look in slightly more detail at this over the coming slides because understanding a fire regime is fairly critical to having a baseline against which we can compare the fires that we've seen in 2020. Can we move to the next slide, please? So a fire regime is normally described in terms of uh, fire severity and a fire return interval or frequency, which is the inverse of um, return interval. The return interval, as, as uh, the name suggests, is the long run average um, time in terms of years between fires. And then severity refers to the effect of fire on vegetation. Um, and that's normally described in terms of the proportion of mortality or the, the, the proportion of overstory trees that are killed during a fire event. Um, and the map on the left, as you can probably see, is uh, displays Oregon, Washington, and California and the vegetation within those states and the groups, the generalized groups of fire regimes. And you can see these on the, on the legend on the top left, we have um, green being uh, fire with groups with um, a fire return interval of less than 35 years um, and typically with low and moderate severity or mixed severity fires, right up to red, which are those fire uh, or those forests with um, a typical fire return interval of more than 200 years. And to go through this in slightly more detail, I've just pulled out the Cascades um, of Oregon and Washington, which is an area where most of the large um, blazes in taking place in Oregon in 2020 occurred. If we could uh, move forward, please. So you can see from the, the amount of red on this map on the left that um, Fire regimes in this area, are, or a large proportion of this area, have return intervals more than 200 years. And in the center, I've pulled out and we can analyze in slightly more detail this return interval. Um, in green, um, most of the medium to dark greens 
our forests with a, a fire return interval, a normal uh, fire return interval of um, upwards of 300 years, between 300 and um, 1,000 years in the extreme. So you can you can see immediately that this is a, this is an extended period of time, and that fire is an important influence in in these forests. But we wouldn't, under historic uh, the assumed historic conditions, have a return interval or a fire return uh, returning in less than 300 years. So when you read a news report and you hear someone a, a broadcaster or um, make a comment about the fact that fires haven't been seen in this particular area in human history, well, it, it sounds extravagant, but uh, you also have to think about the fact that in many of these areas, fires would normally occur at longer time periods than that. So it's just something to bear in mind. Um, in other areas of, uh, areas of this region, um, you can see that fire return intervals are much shorter, often less than um, 10 years. And then in the, uh, the map on the right, displays the probabilities of a high severity fire, which is, is the proportion of total fires which would be expected to burn at high severity. And you can see again that um, for a large amount of the forest in this area, high severity fires are a standard or normal ecological process. So should we be too alarmed by the fact that we have them? Well, we'll see later that, that it is an ecological process that's, that's normal, but the climate is influencing fire behavior and Management is also influ influencing fuels, which also then feeds into um, fire occurrence and behavior. If you can move to the next slide, please. In order to help illustrate fire severity or the concept of it in slightly more detail, um, I've just made this cartoon of a hypothetical forest stand with various um, elements of live and dead uh, vegetation. Um, now, if we have a low severity fire, um, move to the next slide, please. A low severity fire, you can see here, um, would kill most of the understory vegetation, all of the herbaceous material, the grasses, um, all of the shrubs, well, a lot of the shrubs would be top killed or all of the, the uh, above ground vegetation would be on that shrub would be killed. And then in a couple of places, a few trees, maybe trees that have a lower crown, um, they would also be killed or suffer damage. Uh, but in general, most of the overstory is retained. On the other end of the spectrum, if we go up to a high severity fire, um, to move forward, yeah, a high severity fire would leave very little of the overstory intact, although it's important to note that you do get relic patches of undisturbed forest and maybe a few scattered isolated trees that remain. Um, and you'll have lots of dead wood, as you've probably seen from pictures of these environments. And critically, high severity fires often superheat the soil, and this can be a problem in terms of the loss of soil carbon, although that still a fair amount of carbon is retained even in a high severity fire, but a lot less so than in a, a, a low severity. Then on the, uh, the medium between the two is a mixed severity fire, um, fire. And the mixed severity fire is slightly more complex in terms of its um, spatial arrangement um, of, of uh, effects on vegetation. Overall, the amount of, of trees that are killed in a mixed severity fire will be somewhere between a low severity and a high severity but you'll often have this very patchy spatial arrangement where uh, in some areas, the forest will look like a low severity blaze has burned through it. In others, you'll have extreme destruction as if a high severity blaze has occurred. So it, it's a very patchy spatial arrangement. And I think we have a photograph of that here where you can, you can see that. Can we move forward a slide, please? Yeah, so this is a, an example of a fairly recent mixed severity burn environment. And at the back, you can see high severity areas. Uh, and to the left, you can see areas of untouched forest, and then there's some somewhere in between. So if we just move forward another slide, please. So if forest fires are a natural process and um, the, intermediate, the immediate aftermath might look something like what we have on the left, a low severity fire, and mixed severity on the right, and then if we skip forward one slide, um, we have a high severity um, burn. If these are natural processes, then from an ecological perspective, should we be concerned about a forest fire? Um, then next slide. Well, the answer is that in the absence of climate change or other stresses, we shouldn't generally be concerned about a single large forest fire in terms of the recovery of that vegetation. Um, in fact, the immediate aftermath of a fire, what we call the early serial environment or 
um, the preforest phase is often the most rich in terms of biodiversity throughout the, um, the development of forest on that site. It's particularly rich in understory herbs, understory flowers, and uh, shrubs. And as we probably all know here, um, these are very, very good for pollinators, such as the bee, forest bees on the left, um, and for birds. And the, the top left picture you can see is about two years after a fairly high severity fire in the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest in Washington. And then on the top right is four years after the Biscuit Fire in, um, in Southwest Oregon. And these are great environments for biodiversity of all taxa. You have lots of dead wood, which provides food for um, animals and, and birds that eat insects. Um, and then you have lots of, of um, berries and nuts, seeds, and nectar for nectivores. In the center of the picture, you can see a black-backed woodpecker, um, which is more or less dependent on these high severity or mixed severity blazes. Um, Throughout North America, it's found in, um, in areas where you have both uh, lots of dead timber and also um, isolated relic pockets where its, um, its juveniles um, uh, fledge and, and uh, spend the first few months of their life. So these creatures need fire. Um, the same is true for Backland Sparrow, which is on the bottom right. Um, and this bird um, is typically found uh, in um, forests in the southeast of the country, but just during the immediate aftermath of fires, you know, only in the, the, um, the first five years or so after a low severity fire. And then this bird will move on to other areas which have been um, recently burnt in a low severity fire. So this, this phase is, is extremely important for biodiversity. Um, and on that basis, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a fire occurring. Can, can move on to the next slide. However, there are concerns when we think more broadly about fires on aggregate and also about um, other pressures acting as well as fire. And in this slide, um, we have landscape composition being a, a concern. And this is a situation where, as a result of um, human intervention over the past one and a half centuries, um, the landscape is already out of balance in terms of its, its forest age structure or forest composition from what would have been the case under a historical, um, historical regime. Um, and in, in parts of Washington or Western Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, the area of old growth has been drastically reduced as a result of harvesting and um, land use change. So because of this, when we have fires that affect old growth, high severity fires that affect old growth and reduce the area of old growth, then that's a concern for biodiversity that is associated with old growth because there's actually relatively little of that uh, forest age class on the landscape. So that is one concern. If you can move to the next slide. So another concern is that as Eric has, has described well in the, the first piece, wildfires aren't acting as the only stressor on forests. Um, Drought is an extreme pressure. Um, water shortages are a threat to forests all over the world, uh, many different, different regions. Um, a moisture shortage at the individual tree scale acts as a, acts as a, a factor by which uh, individual trees compete with their neighbors. And increasing stress predisp predisposes these forests and these trees to other pests like um, mountain pine beetles, and to other climate related stresses. You add fire into this, particularly more frequent fires as a result of climate change, then you have problems affecting forest persistence in a particular area on the landscape. And this isn't necessarily a, a situation all over, but particularly in hotter, drier environments, persistence is um, a concern because regeneration of forests following wildfire or following any other type of disturbance is more difficult when you have these droughts and other um, temperature related pressures. As an example, um, on, the, on the right here, you can see a map of Southwest Oregon, where you have repeated fires, repeated mixed and high severity blazes in the same area of land. We call these reburns. And as, as you can see from the, uh, the pictures earlier, um, when you have a fire, you have lots of dead wood and dead wood is drier and it's more, easy, uh, more easily burnt. 
So you have reburns often. It's not a, unusual to have a reburn after a fairly high severity fire, but climate change increases the likelihood that these uh, will occur. Um, and you can see from this map, there's a, an area of blue which burnt in 1987. Then there's an area which burnt again in 2002. Then there's part of this area was burnt in both 2017 and in the Checo Bar fire in, two, oh, sorry, 2017 in the, uh, the Checo Bar in 2018 in, in the Klondike fire. And when you get this repeated burning on top of, um, of other stresses, then you get concerns about regeneration of trees on that site. Um, and there are concerns that in some areas you'll have a transition from forests to more open environments dominated by shrubs and uh, herbs. So if we look now at the impact of management on forests, forest fires and climate change, uh, I think everyone listening, um, everyone who's interested in, in being outdoors knows that the US Forest Service has a fairly strong uh, fire suppression policy. Um, which is very different to the way that uh, native tribes managed um, their land previously. Um, from the, the bottom panel here, you can see three fairly graphic images of a high severity burn. This was part of the, um, what was called the big blow up. Uh, happened in 1910 in, uh, throughout the interior Northwest. This is in Montana. And it was the single biggest event which led the Forest Service to implement a fire suppression policy. It was a massive series of blazes that, that uh, caused the destruction of, or the burning of forests over millions and millions of acres. Um, and this, this really set the Forest Service on a fire suppression path, even though, as you can imagine from lack of technology, or worse technology in those days, it was harder to suppress fires. So even implementing a fire suppression policy, it became difficult to act to to um to actually achieve this and we had a series of of major burns in the decades following this after that we uh, the, the forest service began to really clamp down on on um forest fires to the extent that there is now as you'll see a deficit of forest fire on the landscape could move forward on the slide please and this is um a fairly uh attention grabbing graphic of the rising costs of fire suppression. And again, many of you will probably have read about this in newspaper articles. Fire suppression costs have just gone through the roof um, as we try to, to clamp down on these uh, large fires that we've seen, uh, particularly over the last decade. Um, and in the, the medium blue here, you can see US Forest Service costs are, are spending on fire suppression alone. This is not other ancillary components of fire-related activities, just the suppression. And then in the dark blue, you can see total suppression costs. And these have grown astronomically, even over the last few decades. Uh, and the, the green moving average shows that, uh, best of all, if you can move to the next slide, please. Here is a breakdown of the um, Forest Service spending on wildfire as a, in relation to other um, areas of the budget. And the, the blue, um, is a particularly important section of this pie to keep in mind um, because that is spending on the national forest system which is total spending on all of those areas of forest that we like to recreate in throughout the country the maintenance involved in those forests um, that kind of thing then we have research eight percent of spending um, capital improvement eight percent this is in 1995 and wildland fire and management 16 percent we flip forward to only a couple of decades into the future 2015 and the wildland fire management has eaten up 52 percent of the budget and as you can see this this has major impacts on spending in other areas and it's particularly important when we think that we are now as a society placing increasing demand on our forests for recreation for storing carbon for providing clean water for all these kind of things that we we particularly value and yet there is less money available to fund it because of fire suppression costs. And this is proceeded to the extent that now, after reorganization, uh, the Forest Service Fire Management Fund has just been carved out and almost separated from the other management um, expenditures. It, it still, uh, still um, soaks up funding that would otherwise have been spent on other items, but less so um, taking it away from Forest Service expenditure. 
Uh, as you can imagine, though, that this kind of continued increase in costs isn't particularly sustainable. In terms of the ecological impact of fire suppression, um, it's most notably felt in those drier forests that would have burnt with a frequent fire regime. Um, and the ponderosa pine forests um, of east of the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest and down into California are one of the best examples of this. You can see the graphic on the left here, the top left, is of a more traditional structure of a ponderosa pine forest. It's very open, it's a parkland type environment. You have large old trees that are um, fairly widely spaced. And these trees, mature ponderosa pine trees, are extremely resistant to fire. And that's partly because over the years, uh, they have frequent fire exposure, and that creates physical, physiological adaptations that then um, improve future fire resistance. Uh, at the bottom of this picture, you, uh, bottom picture here, you can see what happens after fire suppression. You have a very dense understory of what is normally a, a shade tolerant species like ground fir, and shade tolerant species are those that require uh, less sunlight. Uh, to maintain their, um, their energetic demands. And shade tolerant species generally have fairly low fire resistance, but you can see that because we just don't have as much fire running through these systems, these, uh, these understories are allowed to persist, and that then increases fuel loads for when we do have suitable conditions for a forest fire and we can't suppress it. And again, the graph on the right is, is a fairly clear demonstration of increasing stem density under current um, management conditions to the presumed historical regime and uh, on the vertical axis is stem density and, um, and the horizontal axis are two bars representing current and historical conditions and these are snapshots of situations that exist throughout the dry forests of um, Western North America. If we could move to the next slide please. Um, changes in fuel loading um, are a primary concern um, for forest management. You can see that because of these understories, we have what's called uh, the development of ladder fuels, and these ladder fuels connect the surface layer to the canopy um, and allow fire to propagate into the canopy where it can be very destructive. Move to the next slide, please. This slide is probably a slightly more complicated than I have time for, so uh, feel free to ask questions at the end, but it's essentially showing that we have uh, less fire on the landscape than um, we would have done under historical conditions without fire suppression, and that fire suppression is shifting fire regimes in favor of higher severity fires often, um, and mixed severity fires against low severity fires. But we can come back to this later if we have time. We move forward. So there are three main management options for reducing this fire, this buildup of fuels and the fire deficit that we have. The first of these is to just let natural ignitions burn, um, natural ignitions being from wild uh, lightning normally. Um, and this is clearly an option which is likely to be most palatable in fairly remote areas, such as the image here in, um, in Wyoming, less palatable in uh, heavily populated areas. If we can move forward, please. Another option is mechanical fuel reduction, which could be either thinning or mastication. Mastication is the breaking up and chipping of um, dense understory vegetation, and thinning normally relates to uh, merchantable timber. Um, it's a fairly standard forest management practice that we normally do to reallocate growth resources to the residual trees. But in this case, it serves to reduce fuels and therefore um, reduce individual tree stress levels and reduce the um, availability of fuel for fire. And then finally, we have, if we move forward, um, we have prescribed fire, which is probably something that everyone has heard about after the summer's um, fires. It's already used fairly widely, particularly in the Southeast. And it's the deliberate uh, setting of low severity fires, which burn through the understory um, under extremely controlled conditions. There are not many uh, burn windows are, are very, very heavily um, restricted based on wind directions and, and other environmental conditions. They do serve to reduce fuels um, 
and that they're very effective, particularly when combined with mechanical uh, treatments. But there are issues in terms of um, public uh, willingness to put up with smoke and other side effects of prescribed fire. So um, I think that's a, a decent segue to hand back to Eric. Great, thank you, Neil. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to close things out with a few thoughts about changes that are taking place in development patterns along the wildland urban interface and um, some closing thoughts about what can be done to um, try to deal with that problem. So the map that we've got here um, shows change in development patterns for the period 1990 through um, 2010. Um, the way this reads um, is that the red areas are new development in the wildland urban interface. And, and just to provide a definition there, what we're talking about is areas that were previously 100% um, forested and um, on the urban fringe. And then we start to see new development sort of penetrating into that and, and starting to um, break up the forested landscape. Um, but rather than being sort of a sharp differentiation, um, it's a very ragged edge, if you will. Um, so it creates a, a real difficult situation um, from a firefighting perspective. Uh, the, the zoom in on the right here, um, figure three, corresponds to the small box um, in Central California on the map on the left. Uh, the way this reads is the tan area are persistent areas where you've got this problem of development in penetrating um, this interface area. Uh, the red um, is new development that occurred during this period. Um, so you can see over time, we've got an additive effect, if you will. Uh, moving on to our next slide here, this has got some of the statistics. This is from the same study um, that puts some numbers um, to you know, help you appreciate the map shown previously. Uh, so for the same time period, uh, the number of houses in the interface increased from 31 to 43 million, a 41% increase in this relatively short period of time. And then the land area in the interface increased from 224,000 to 297,000 square miles. So it gives you an idea of the magnitude of the problem. So, you know, I think this is, is pretty obvious, but, you know, what we're talking about now is the intersection of these climate exacerbated factors that we spoke of earlier. Um, some of the impacts on, on forest structure and forest health that Neil spoke to. And then we've got the compounding effect of this change in, in distribution of urban development. And it, it's really this last factor that I think is um, so troubling. And, and whereas, you know, a lot of what Neil sketched out is, you know, a lot of this part of the world is a fire adapted landscape from a forest perspective. Um, obviously, once you have homes in, this, in these areas, you've got a distinctly different set of problems. Um, as I said, you know, difficult to fight fire in this environment. You've got the possibility of increased ignition due to the presence of, of all these homes in the interface. And then you've also got um, real limitations placed on the management options. For instance, the prescribed burn that Neil just spoke about is much more difficult if you've got an area where you've got this interpenetration between development and forested areas. So a few thoughts about what can be done at different geographic scales to deal with this problem. Um, you know, once the developments occurred, you can't really roll that back. Um, so there's a lot of focus on what's called firewise landscaping. And that's what this slide lays out. And, and basically they define different distances from the house and what can be done. And in a, a very general sense, we're talking about reducing the fuels in the area. So taking out any, any dead wood and then also um, some modification to the trees, um, you know, cutting out um, low lying, or excuse me, lower limbs, um, so that uh, you know, the, the slide that Neil had up on ladder fuels is, is um, pertinent here. So you're trying to reduce um, the movement of, of ground fire up into the canopy by some of these moves. So these are some things that can be done, you know, at, at the site level, if you will. Um, moving on to the regional level, um, th this, this map is actually from some work um, that I've been involved in here at Manament. Um, this is a, a map of, of green infrastructure, 
analysis that we did for the Taunton watershed here in Massachusetts. Um, and, and our focus here was really on um, ecological integrity and habitat value um, and, and trying to be very smart about differentiating um, lands for future conservation efforts from lands that are more appropriate um, for urbanization. But this, this same approach, I think, really um, is, is a value in thinking about this problem um, at, at the urban wildland interface uh, shown on the previous maps. Uh, if we can be smarter about making this differentiation, um, if we can do a better job of clustering development in those areas that are more suitable to support it, then it lessens a lot of those issues that I just spoke to associated with fire in the interface area. Um, you know, and I think a, a lot of people um, might see this as being sort of a heavy handed approach from a governmental perspective, but let me offer that I think um, this can actually result in um, some great outcomes in that um, the, the population that has access to the natural resource area now has access to a, a healthier and, and more intact resource. Um, and so I think that, you know, this is an approach that, that offers um, some hope, both in terms of, of fire management, but also in terms of, of bigger picture habitat concerns. And then finally, um, moving to a much broader geographic scale, um, this is uh, some more work underway at Manament. Um, uh, Neil and I manage um, the Climate Smart Land Network, which is a membership organization for forestry companies. And you can see from the roster sh shown on the left, you know, we've got most of the big forestry companies um, in North America involved at this point, uh, representing over 33 million acres in North America. And so we're working with this group, um, both on the adaptation side, um, some of the forest management measures that Neil spoke to, but also we've got a project underway now um, looking at, at the climate change mitigation value or the carbon sequestration value of, of these commercial forests. So I think this is another example of how we can, you know, a range of different geographic scales and, and think about um, how we deal with this, this tough problem of, of development in that interface area. So that is, our final slide of our presentation. So at this point, uh, we're going to open it up for questions. So. Excellent. Thank you ver both very much. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, please put those into the Q&A box, please. Um, to start things off, I was curious, have any of your members on the West Coast been directly affected by the wildfires this season? Yeah, yeah, very, very much so. And, um, you know, we, we do monthly uh, meetings with them, you know, on, on, on the effort that we've got underway on climate mitigation. And so we've had a, a lot of discussion recently, I mean, in particular, um, Weyerhaeuser had some really pointed stories about areas where they've got um, both um, managed forest and some research initiatives underway that have been heavily impacted. Excellent. And are there any other areas of the country that you feel are kind of ripe for to see the same kind of impacts that we're seeing on the West Coast with wildfires? How do you see things coming and changing here in New England? Well, in, in New England, um, you know, we're fortunate in that we've got a moist enough environment that we aren't really on the cusp of any big change. However, in, in the southeastern U.S., that is a part of the country that's drying. And if you, if you think back, um, there was a really impactful fire in the Great Smoky Mountains that, um, you know, I think really scared a lot of people. And, and with that part of the world um, drying out, um, I, th I think, in, if you think back to the map that I showed of the interface areas, um, you know, we've really got <laughs> much more of an interpenetration problem um, in, in the uh, area in the southeast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just thought as well that um, with the exception of some of the, the more northern forests, uh, Eric mentioned we have lots of, of moist forest environments in New England, but forests throughout the country generally have fire in their, in their ecological toolbox. It's, it's a process that affects forests throughout North America, whether it's the boreal forests of Canada, whether it's um, some of the oak hickory forests of Rhode Island where I live, um, or whether it's the, the, the pine savannas in the Southeast. And it's, it is a natural process that, that would occur in the absence of, of management intervention um, 
in large parts of the country. Excellent. Um, and then it, does anybody else have anything to ask here? Uh, was there anything else that we haven't touched on or Neil, there were a couple slides that you mentioned uh, potentially going back to um, explain. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do have a question. Um, so what would be your main takeaways to pass along to other um, that people could share with the general public who weren't able to tune in? What are the kind of quick synthesis of this very complicated issue? <laughs> Um, well, just, just to reiterate a point that I made earlier, uh, certainly, you know, there are many, many reasons why we need to come up with effective global and national solutions to the climate problem. And, you know, fire is one of the reasons, it's certainly not the only reason, but um, that, that's, you know, for me, one of my big take homes on all of this is that um, we're really going to have a hard time getting a handle on the fire problem if we can't get a handle on the, on the climate issue. So. I would add to that that because of, of warming that's already baked in because of climate change, um, fire is going to be something that we need to become more resilient to, to come to prepare our communities to. There is, there is just no getting away from the fact that we are going to have to have either managed fires like prescribed prescribed fires or or in some way reduce fuel loads uh, other ways or we have natural fires so it's a question of how on what terms we want those fires to occur we, we, we do have to accept that it is going to be more commonplace so we need to prepare for it I think that is a wonderful note for us to end this evening on um, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to tackle this really complicated issue and explain it to us all um, and give us a much better understanding of the science behind wildfires and climate change and how it all connects. And thank you to everybody else who was able to attend and be part of tonight's presentation. I know many of you are longtime supporters of Manomet and I wanna say thank you. Uh, we are very grateful for your generosity and commitment to this organization. I hope to see you again on a webinar very soon. And thank you to everybody and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining.